Welcome. The Ban of the Black Swords. Book 5 of the Elric Saga by Michael Moorcock. Book 2 Kings in Darkness. Three kings in darkness lie Guteran of Orc. And I, under a bleak and sunless sky, the third beneath the hill. Song of Burkhardt by James Cowthorn. One. Elric, Lord of the Lost, and Sundered Empire of Melnibone, rode like a fanged wolf from a trap. All slavering madness and mirth. He rode from Natsukor, city of beggars, and there was hate in his wake, for he had been recognized as their old enemy before he could obtain the secrets he had sought there. Now they hounded him, and the grotesque little man who rode laughing at Elric's side. Moongloom, the Outlander, from Elwer and the unmapped East. The flames of brands devoured the velvets of the night as the yelling, ragged throng pushed their bony nags in pursuit of the pair. Star wellings and tattered jackals that they wear, there was strength in their gaudy numbers, and long knives and bone bows glinted in the brand light. They were too strong for a couple of men to fight, too few to represent serious danger in a hunt. So Elric and Moongloom had chosen to leave the city without disputes, and now sped towards the full and rising moon, which stabbed its sickly beams through the darkness to show them the disturbing waters of the Warcock River and the chance of escape from the incensed mob. They had half a mind to stand and face the mob, since the Warcock was their only alternative. But they knew well that the beggars would do to them. What the beggars would do to them, whereas they were uncertain what would become of them once they had entered the river. The horses reached the sloping banks of the Warcock and reared, with hooves lashing. Cursing, the two men spurred the steeds and forced them down towards the water. Into the river the horses plunged, snorting and spluttering. Into the river which led a roaring course towards the hell-spound forest of Tros which lay within the borders of Orc, country of necromancy and rotting, ancient evil. Elric blew water away from his mouth and coughed. They'll not follow us to the tross, I think. He shouted at his companion. Moongloom said nothing. He only grinned, showing his white teeth and the unhidden fear in his eyes. The horses swam strongly with the currents, and behind them the ragged mob shrieked in frustrated bloodlusts, while some of their number laughed and jeered. Let the forest do our work for us. 
Elric laughed back at them, wildly. As the horses swam on down the dark, straight river, wide and deep, towards a sun-starred morning, cold and spiky with ice. Scattered, slim-peaked crags loomed on either side of the flat plain through which the river ran swiftly. Green-tinted masses of jutting blacks and browns spread color through the rocks and the grass was waving on the plain as if for some purpose. Through the downlight, the beggar crew chased along the banks but eventually gave up their quarry to return. Shattering the Natsukor. When they had gone, Elric and Moonglum made their mounts swim towards the banks and climbed, stumbling to the top where rocks and grass had already given way to sparse forest land which rose starkly on all sides, staining the earth with somber shade. The foliage waved jerkily, as if alive, sentient. It was a forest of malignantly erupting blooms, blood-colored and sickly mottled. A forest of bending, sinuously smooth trunks, black and shiny. A forest of spiked leaves of murky purples and gleaming greens. Certainly an unhealthy place, if jugged only by the odor of rotting vegetation which was almost unbearable, impinging as it did upon the fastidious nostrils of Elric and Mungu. Mondlum wrinkled his nose and jerked his head in the direction they had come. Back now, he inquired. We can avoid throws and cut swiftly across a corner of orc to be in Bakshan in just over a day. What say you, Elric? Elric frowned. I don't doubt. They welcomed us in Bakshan with the same warmth we received in Natsukor. They'll not have forgotten the destruction we brought there, and the wealth we acquired from their merchants. No, I have a fancy to explore the forest a little. I have heard the tales of Orc and its unnatural forest and should like to investigate the truth of them. My blade and sorcery will protect us, if necessary. Moonglum sighed. Elric, this once, let us not court the danger. Elric smiled icily. Scarlet's eyes blazed out of his dead white skin with peculiar intensity. Danger? It can bring only death. That is not to my liking just yet, Mongloom said. The flesh pots of Bakshan, or if you prefer Jadmar on the other hand, but Elric was already urging his horse onwards, heading for the forest. Moongloom sights and followed. Soon dark blossoms hid most of the sky, which was dark enough, and they could see only a little way in all directions. The rest of the forest seemed vast and sprawling. They could sense this, though sight of most of it was lost in the depressing gloom. 
Moonbloom recognized the forest from descriptions he had heard from mad eye travelers who drank purposefully, who drank purposefully in the shadows of Natsa Court's taverns. This is the forest of Tross, sure enough, he said to Ellery. It's told of how the doomed folk released tremendous forces upon the earth and caused terrible changes among men, beasts, and vegetation. This forest is the last they created and the last to perish. A child will always hate its parents at certain times, Elric said mysteriously, children of whom to be extremely wary, I should think, Mongloom retorted. Some say that when they were at the peak of their power, they had no gods to frighten them. A daring people indeed, Elric replied with a faint smile. They have my respect, now fear, and the gods are back, and that at least is comforting. Mungloom puzzled over this for a short time, and then eventually said nothing. He was beginning to feel uneasy. The, flay, the place was full of malicious rustlings and whispers, though no living animal inhabited it. Though no living animal inhabited it as far as they could tell. There was a discomforting absence of birds, rodents, or insects, and though they normally had no love for such creatures, they would have appreciated their company in the disconcerting forest. In a quavering voice, Mungum began to sing a song in the hope that it would keep his spirits up and his thoughts of the lurking forest. A grin and the word is my trade. From these my profit is made. Though my body is not tall and my courage is small, my fame will take longer to fade. No, so singing with his natural amiability returning, Mungum rode after the man he regarded as a friend. A friend who possessed something akin to mastery over him, though neither admitted it. Elric smiled at Mungum's song. To sink of one's own lack of size and absence of courage is not an action designed to ward off one's enemies, Mondo. But this way I offer no provocation, Mongloom replied glibly. If I think of my shortcomings, I'm safe. If I were to boast of my talents, then someone might consider this to be a challenge and decide to teach me a lesson. True, Elric assented gravely and well spoken. He began pointing at certain blossoms and leaves, remarking upon their alien tint and texture 
referring to them in words which Mungum could not understand, though he knew the words to be part of a sorcerer's vocabulary. The albino seemed to be untroubled by the fears which beset the Eastlander, but often Mungum knew appearances with Elric could hide the opposite of what they indicated. They stopped for a short break while Elric sifted through some of the samples he had torn from trees and plants. He carefully placed his prizes in his belt pouch, but would say nothing of why he did so to Moonglum. Come, he said, Tro's mysteries awaits us. But then a new voice. A woman's, said softly from the gloom. Save the excursion for another day, strangers. Elric reined his horse, one hand at the Stormbringer's hilt. The voice had had an unusual effect upon him. It had been low, deep, and had, for a moment, sent the pulse in his throat throbbing. Incredibly, he sensed that he was suddenly standing on one of fate's roads, but where the road would take him, he did not know. Quickly, he controlled his mind, and then his body, and then looked towards the shadows from where the voice had come. You are very kind to offer us advice, madame, he said sternly. Come, show yourself and give explanation. She rode then very slowly on a black-coated gelding that pranced with the power she could barely restrain. Moonglum drew an appreciative... Moonglum drew an appreciative breath for, although heavy featured, she was incredibly beautiful. Her face and bearing was patrician, her eyes were grey-green, combining enigma and innocence. She was very young. For all her obvious womanhood and beauty, Moonbloom aged her at seventeen or little more. Elric frowned. Do you ride alone? I do not know, she replied, trying to hide her obvious astonishment at his, at the albinus coloring. I need aid, protection, men who will escort me safely to Carlock. There they will be paid. Carlock by the weeping wastes. It lies the other side of Ilmiora, a hundred leagues away, and the weeks traveling at speed. Elric did not wait for her to reply to this statement. We are not hirelings, madame. Then you are bound by the vows of chivalry, sir, and cannot refuse my request. Elric laughed shortly. Chivalry, madame. We come not from the upstart nations of the South with their strange codes and rules of behavior. We are nobles of older stock whose actions are governed by our own desires. You would not ask what you do if you knew our names. 
she wetted her full lips with her tongue and said almost timidly, You are Elric of Melnibone, Madame. Madame called Elric woman slayer in the West. And this is the moon gloom of Elwer. He has no conscience. She said, There are legends. The white-faced reaver, the hell-driven sorcerer, with a blade that drinks the soul of man? Aye, that's true. And however magnified they are with the retelling, they cannot hint those tales at the darker truths which lie in their origin. Now, madame, do you still seek our aid? Elric's voice was gentle, without menace, as he saw that she was very much afraid, although she had managed to control the signs of fear and her lips were tight with determination. I have no choice. I am at your mercy, my father. The senior senator of Karlak is very rich. Karlak is called the city of the jade towers, as you will know, and such rare jades and embers we have. Many could be yours. Be careful, madame, lest you anger me. Warned Elric, although Moongloom's bright eyes lightened with avarice. We are not next to be hired or goods to be bought. Besides which, he smiled disdainfully. I am from crumbling Irmer, the dreaming city, from the Isle of the Dragon, hub of the ancient Melnibone, and I know what beauty really is. Your bowels cannot tempt one who has looked upon the milky heart of Eriuch, upon the blinding iridescence that drops from the ruby throne of the languorous and unnameable colors in the axurious stone of the Ring of Kings. These are more than jewels, madame. They contain the life stuff of the universe. I apologize, Lord Elric, and to you, Sir Moonbloom, Elric laughed, almost with affection. We are green clowns, lady. But the gods of luck aided our escape from the Nazi and we owe them a debt. We'll escort you to the Karlak, city of the Jade Towers, and explore the forest of Tros another time. Her things was tempered with a weary look in her eyes. And now we have made introductions, said Elric. Perhaps you would be good enough to give your name and tell us your story. I am Zarazinia from Karlak, a daughter of the Washun the most powerful clan in the southeastern Ilmior. We have kinsmen in the trading cities on the coasts of Picardia, and I went with two cousins and my uncle to visit them. A perilous journey, Lady Zarazini. I and they are not only natural dangers, sir, two weeks ago, we made our goodbyes and began the journey home. Safely we crossed the Straits of Velmer and there employed men-at-arms 
forming a strong caravan to journey through Velmer and Soto il Mior. We skirted Natsuko since we had heard that the city of beggars is inhospitable to honest travelers. Here Elric smiled. And sometimes to dishonest travelers, as we can appreciate. Again the expression on her face showed that she had some difficulty in equating his obvious good humor with his evil reputation. Having skirted Natsuko, she continued, We came this way and reached the borders of Org, wherein, of course, Tross lies, very warily. We traveled, knowing Dark Orc's reputation, along the fringes of the forest, and then we were ambushed, and our hired men at times deserted us. Ambushed, eh? Broke in Mungu. By whom, madame, did you know? By their unsavory looks and squat shapes. They seemed natives. They fell upon the caravan, and my uncle and cousins fought bravely, but were slain. One of my cousins slapped the rump of my gelding and sent it galloping so that I could not control it. I heard terrible screams, mad, giggling shouts, and when I at last brought my horse to a halt. I was lost. Later I heard your approach and waited in fear for you to pass, thinking you also were of orc. But when I heard your accents and some of your speech, I thought that you might help me. And help you we shall, madame said Mungum bowing gallantly from the saddle. And I am indebted to you for convincing, for convincing Lord Elric here of your needs. But for you, we should be deep in this awful forest by now and experiencing strange terrors, no doubt. I offer my sorrow for your dead kinsfolk, and assure you that you will be protected from now onwards by more than swords and brave hearts, for sorcery can be called up if needs be. Let's hope there'll be no need, frowned Elric. You talk blightly of sorcery, friend Moongloom, you who hate the art. Moonglum grins. I was consoling the young lady, Elric, and I had occasion to be grateful for your horrid powers, I'll admit. Now I suggest that we make camp for the night, and so refresh be on our way at dawn. I'll agree to that, said Elric glancing almost with embarrassment at the girl. Again, he felt the pulse in his throat, and this time he had more difficulty in controlling it. The girl also seemed fascinated by the albino. There was an attraction between them which might be strong enough to throw both their destinies along widely different paths than than any they had guessed. Night came again quickly, for the days were short in those parts. While Moongloom tended the fire, nervously peering around him, Zarazinia, a richly embroidered cloth of cold gowns shimmering in the firelight, walked gracefully to where Elric sat sorting the herbs he had collected. She glanced at him cautiously, 
and then seeing that he was absorbed, stared at him with open curiosity. He looked up and smiled faintly, his eyes for once unprotected, his strange face frank and pleasant. Some of these are healing herbs, he said, and others are used in summoning spirits. Yet others give unnatural strength to the imbiber and some turn man mad. They will be useful to me. She sat down beside him her thick-fingered hands pushing her black hair back, her small breasts lifted and fell rapidly. Are you really the terrible, evil bringer of the legends, Lord Elric? I find it hard to credit. I have brought evil to many places, he said, but usually there has already been evil to match mine. I seek no excuses, for I know what I am and I know what I have done. I have slain malignant sorcerer and destroyed oppressors. But I have also been responsible for slaying fine men and the woman, my cousin, whom I loved, I killed, or my sword did. And you are master of your swords? I often wonder, without it, I am helpless. He put his hand around Stormbringer's hilt. I should be grateful to it. Once again his red eyes seemed to become deeper, protecting some bitter emotion rooted at the core of his soul. I am sorry if I revived unpleasant recollection. Do not feel sorry, Lady Zarazinia. The pain is within me. You did not put it there. In fact, I'd say you relieve it greatly by your presence. Half startled, she glanced at him and smiled. I'm no wanton, sir, she said, but... He got up quickly. Mongol, is the fire going well? Aye, Elric. She'll stay in for the night. Mongol cocked his head on one side. It was unlike Elric to make such empty queries. But Elric said nothing further, so the Eastlander shrugged, turned away to check his gear. Since he could think of little else to say, Alec turned and said quietly, urgently, I am killer and thief, not fit to. Lord Elric, I am. You are infatuated by a legend, that is all. No, if you feel what I feel, then you'll know it's more. You are young. Old enough. Beware, I must fulfill my destiny. Your destiny? It is no destiny at all. But an awful thing called doom. And I have no pity except when I see something in my own soul. Then I have pity and I pity. But I hate to look. This is the part of the doom which drives me, not fate, nor the stars, nor men, nor demons, nor gods. Look at me, Zarazinia. It is Elric, 
poor white chosen plaything of the gods of time, Elric of Malibone, who causes his own gradual and terrible destruction. It is suicides. I, I dry myself to slow death. And those who go with me suffer also. You speak falsely, Lord Elric, from guilt madness. Because I am guilty, lady. And does Sir Mungloom go to doom with you? He is unlike others, he is indestructible in his own self-assurance. I am confident also, Lord Elric, but your confidence is that of youth, it is different. Need I lose it with my youth? You have strength, you are strong as we are, I'll grant you that. She opened her arms, rising. Then be reconciled, Elric of Melnibo. And he was. He seized her, kissing her with a deeper need than that of passion. For the first time, Samaril of the Emrer was forgotten as they lay down together on the soft turf oblivious of Munglum who polished away at his curved sword with a bright jealousy. They all slept, and the fire waned. Elric, in his joy, had forgotten, or not heeded, that he had a watch to take, and Munglum, who had no source of strength but himself, Stayed awake for as long as he could, but sleep overcame him. In the shadows of the awful trees, figures moved with shambling caution. The, mishap, the misshapen man of Org began to creep inwards towards the sleepers. Then Elric opened his eyes. Aroused by instinct, stared at Zerosinia's peaceful face beside him, moved his eyes without turning his head and saw the danger. He rolled over, grasped Stormbringer and tugged the rune blade from its sheath. The sword hunt, as if in anger at being awakened. Munglu, danger! Elric bellowed in fear, for he had more to protect in his own life. The little man's head jerked up. His curved saber was already across his knees, and he jumped to his feet, ran towards Elric as the man of Org closed in. I apologize, he said. My fault, I... And then the men of Org were at them. Elric and Mungun stood over the girl as she came awake, saw the situation, and did not scream. Instead, she looked around for a weapon but found none. She remained still where she was, the only thing to do. Smelling like awful, the gibbering creatures, some dozen of them, Slashed at Elric and Mungloom with heavy blades like cleavers, long and dangerous. Stormbringer winds and smote through a cleaver, cut into a neck and beheaded the owner. Blood gurgled from the corpse as it slumped back across the fire. Mungloom ducked beneath a holding clever. Moonglum ducked beneath a holing cleaver. 
a howling cleaver, lost his balance, fell, slashed at his opponent's legs and hamstrung him so that he collapsed shrieking. Monglum stayed on the ground and lunged upwards, taking another in the heart. Then he sprang to his feet and stood shoulder to shoulder with Elric while Zarazinia got up behind him. The horses, grounded Elric, if it's safe, try to get them. There were still seven natives standing, and Moonbloom groaned as a cleaver sliced flesh from his left arm, retaliated, pierced the man's throat, turned slightly, and sheared off another space. They pressed forward, taking the attack to the incensed foe. His left hand covered with his own blood. Moglum painfully pulled his long point guard from its sheath and held it with his thumb along the hand, blocked an opponent's swing, closed in and killed him with the ripping upward thrust of the dagger the action of which caused his wounds to pound with agony. Elric held his great rune sword in both hands and swung it in a semicircle, hacking down the howling misshapen things. Zarazinia darted towards the horses, leaped onto her own, and led the other two towards the fighting men. Elric smote at another and got into his saddle, thanking his own forethought to leave the equipment on the horses in case of danger. Moonglum quickly joined him, and they thundered out of the clearing. The saddlebags! Moonglum called in greater agony than that created by his wound. We've left the saddlebags! What of it? Don't press your luck, my friend. But all our treasures in them. Elric laughed, partly in relief, partly from real humor. We'll retrieve them, friend, never fear. I know you, Elric. You, you no value for realities. But even Moonglum was laughing as they left the enraged man of orc behind him and slowed to a canter. Elric reached and hugged Zarazin. You have the courage of your noble clan in your veins, he said. Thank you, she replied, pleased with the compliments. But we cannot match such sportsmanship as that displayed by you and Munglum. It was fantastic. Thank the blades, he said shortly. No, I will thank you. I think you place too much reliance upon that hell weapon, however powerful it is. I need it. For what? For my own strength and now to give strength to you. I'm no vampire, she smiled, and need no such fearful strength as that supplies. Then be assured that I do, he told her gravely. You would not love me if the blade did not give me what I need. I'm like a spineless sea thing without it. I do not believe that, but will not dispute with you now. They rode for a while without speaking. 
Later, they stopped, dismounted, and Zarazinia put herbs that Elric had given her upon Mungum's bonded arm and began to bind it. Elric was thinking deeply. The forest rustled with macabre, sensuous sounds. We're in the heart of Tros, he said, and our intention to scare to the forest has been forestalled. I have it in mind to call on the King of Oregon so round of our visits. Mungum laughed. Shall we send our swords along first and bind our own hands? His pain was already eased by the herbs which were having quick effect. I mean it. We owe all of us much to the men of work. They slew, Zarani they slew Zarazinia's uncle and cousins. They wounded you, and they now have our treasure. We have many reasons for asking the king for our recompense. Also, they seem stupid and should be easy to trick. Aye, the king will pay us back for our lack of common sense by tearing our limbs off. I am in earnest. I think we should go. I'll agree that I'd like our wealth returned to us, but we cannot risk the lady's safety, Elric. I am to be Elric's wife, Mungo. Therefore, if he visits the King of Org, I shall come too. Mungo lifted an eyebrow, a quick kerchief. She speaks the truth, however. We shall all go to Orc, and sorcery will protect us from the king's uncalled for wrath. And still you wish for death and vengeance, Elric, shrugged Mongum's mounting. Well, it's all the same to me since you wrote whatever else are profitable ones. You may be the lord of bad luck by your own reckoning, but you bring good luck to me, I'll say that. No more courting death, smiled Elric. But <laughs> we'll have some revenge, I hope. Down will be with us soon, Mongum said. The organ citadel lies six hours' ride from here by my working. Southeast, e south, southeast by the ancient star. If the map I memorized in Natsukor was correct, you have an instinct for direction that never fails, Mongun. Every caravan should have such a man as you. We base on an entire philosophy on the stars in Elver, Mongun replies. We regard them as the master plan for everything that happens on Earth. As they revolve around the planets, they see all things. Past and present, future, they are gods. Predictable gods, at least, said Elric, and they rode up towards Org with light hearts, considering the enormity of their risk. 2. Little was known of the tiny kingdom of Org save that the forest of Tros lay within its boundaries, and to that other nations felt it was welcome. The people were unpleasant to look upon, 
for the most part, and their bodies were stunted and strangely altered. Legend had it that they were the descendants of the doomed folk. Their rulers, it was said, were shaped like normal men in so far as their outward bodily appearance went, but their minds were warped more horribly than the limbs of their subjects. The inhabitants were few and were generally scarce, ruled by their king from his citadel, which was also called Orc. It was for this citadel that Elric and his companions rode, and as they did so, Elric explained how he planned to protect all from the natives of Orc. In the forest he had found a particular leaf, which, when used with certain invocations, which were harmless in that the invoker was in little danger of being harmed by the spirits he marshals, would invest that person and anyone else to whom he gave the drug distilled from the leaf with temporary invulnerability, would invest that person and anyone else to whom he gave the drug distilled from the leaf with temporary, with temporary invulnerability. The spell somehow reconnected the skin and flesh structure and the flesh structure so that it could withstand any edge and almost any blow. Elric explains in rare garrulous mood how the drug and spell combined to achieve the effects, but his archaism and esoteric words meant little to the other two. They stopped an hour's ride from where Mungum expected to bind the citadel so that Elric could prepare the drug and invoke the spell. He worked swiftly over a small fire using an alchemist's pestle and mortar mixing the shredded leaf with a little water. As the brew bubbled on the fire, he drew peculiar runes on the ground, some of which were twisted into such alien forms that they seemed to disappear into a different dimension and reappear beyond it. Bone and blood and flesh and sinew, spell and spirit bind anew, Potent potion work the life charm. Keep its stakers safe from harm. So Elric chanted as a small pink cloud formed in the air over the fire, wavered, reformed into a spiral shape which curled downwards into the bowl. The brew spluttered and then was still. The albino sorcerer said, An old boyhood spell, so simple that I near forgotten it. The leaf for the potion grows only in troughs, therefore it is rarely possible to perform. The brew, which had been liquid, had now solidified and Elric broke it into small pellets. Too much, he warned. Taken at one time is poison, and yet the effect can last for several hours. Not always, though, but we must accept that small risk. He handed both of them a pallet which they received dubiously. Swallow them just before we reach the citadel he told, or in the event of the man of orc finding us first. 
Then they mounted and rode on again. Some miles to the southeast of Tros, a blind man sang a grim song in his sleep and so woke himself. They reached the brooding citadel of Orc at dusk. Guttural voices shouted at them from the battlements of the square-cut ancient dwelling place of the kings of Orc. The thick rock oozed moisture and was corroded by lichen and sickly mottled moss. The only entrance large enough for a mounted man to pass through was reached by a path almost a foot deep in evil-smelling black mud. What's your business at the royal courts of Guteran the Mighty? They could not see who asked the question. We seek hospitality and an audience with your leash, called Munglum cheerfully, successfully hiding his nervousness. We bring important news to Orc. A twisted face peered down from the battlements. Enter, strangers, and be welcome, it said unwelcomely. The heavy wooden draw gate shifted upwards to allow them entrance, and the horses pushed their way slowly through the mud and so into the courtyard of the citadel. Overhead, the gray sky was a racing field of black tattered clouds which streamed towards which streamed towards the horizon as if to escape the hurried boundaries of Orc and the disgusting forest of Tros. The courtyard was covered, though not so deeply, with the same foul muds as had unpaired their progress to the citadel. It was full of heavy and moving shadow. On Elric's right, a flight of steps went up to an arched entrance, which was hung partially with the same unhealthy lichen he had seen on the outer walls and also in the forest of Troth. Through this archway, brushing at the lichen with the pale, Berenged hand, a tall man came and stood on the top step, regarding the visitors through heavy lidded eyes. He was, in contrast to the others, handsome, with a massive, lounging head and long hair as white as Elric's, although the hair on the head of this great solid man was somewhat dirty, tangled, unbrushed. He was dressed in a heavy jerkin of quilted and brassed leather, a yellow kit which reached to his ankles, and he carried a wide bladed dagger naked in his belt. He was older than Elric aged between 40 and 50, and his powerful, if somewhat decadent face was seamed and pockmarked. He stared at them in silence and did not welcome them. Instead, he signed to one of the battlement guards who caused the draggy to be lowered. It came down with a crash, blocking up their way of escape. Kill the man and keep the woman, said the massive man in a low monotone. Elric had heard dead men speak in that manner. As plans. Elric and Moongloom stood either side of Zarazinia and remained where they were. 
arms folded. Puzzled, shambling creatures came warily at them, their loose trousers dragging in the mud, their hands hidden by the long shapeless sleeves of their filthy garments. They swung their clivers. Elric felt a faint shock as the blade thudded onto his arm, but that was all. Moongloom's experience was similar. The men fell back, amazement and confusion on their bestial faces. The tall man's eyes widened. He put one ring-covered hand to his thick lips, chewing at the nail. Our swords have no effect upon them, King. They do not cut and they do not bleed. What are these for? Elric laughed theatrically. We are not common folk, little human. Be assured. We are the messengers of the gods. And come to your king with a message from our great masters. Do not worry, we shall not harm you since we are in no danger of being harmed. Stand aside and make us welcome. Elric could see that King Gutteran was puzzled and not absolutely taken in by his words. Elric cursed to himself. He had measured their intelligence by those he had seen. This king, mad or not, was much more intelligent, but it's going to be harder to deceive. He led the way up the steps towards Glovering Gutteran. Greetings, King Gutteran. The gods have at last returned to Orc and wish you to notice. Org has had no gods to worship for an eternity. Said Gatran hold lowly. Said Gatran hollowly turning back into the citadel. Why should we accept them now? You are impertinent, King. And you are audacious. How do I know you come from the gods? He walked ahead of them, leading them through the low-roofed halls. You saw that the swords of your subjects had no effect upon us. True. I'll take that incident as a proof or the moment. I suppose there must be a banquet in your honor. I shall order it. Be welcome, messengers. His words were ungracious, but it was virtually impossible to detect anything from gutter and stone, since the man's voice stay at the same pitch. Elric pushed his heavy riding clock back from his shoulders and said lightly, We shall mention your kindness to our masters. The court was a place of gloomy halls and false laughter, and although Elric put many questions to Gutteran, the king would not answer them, or did so by means of ambiguous phrases, which meant nothing. They were not given chambers wherein they could refresh themselves but instead stood about for several hours in the main hall of the citadel, and Gutteran, while he was with them, and not giving orders for the banquets, 
sat slammed on his throne and chewed at his nails, ignoring them. Pleasant hospitality, whispered Mungu. Elric, how long will the effects of the drug last? Zarazinia had remained close to him. He put his arm around her shoulders. I do not know, not much longer, but it has served its purpose. I doubt if they will try to attack us a second time. However, beware of other attempts, subtle ones, upon our lives. The main hall, which had a higher roof than the others and was completely surrounded by a gallery which ran around it well above the floor, fairly close to the room, was chilly and unwarmed. No fires burned in the several hearths, which were open and let into the floor, and the walls dripped moisture and were undecorated, damp, solid stone, time-worn and gaunt. There were not even rushes upon the floor, which was which was strewn with old bones and pieces of decaying food. Hardly house proud, are they? commented Moongloom, looking around him with distaste and glancing at brooding Gatran, who was seemingly oblivious of their presence. A servitor shambled into the hall and whispered a few words to the king. He nodded and arose, leaving the great hall. Soon men came in, carrying benches and tables, and began to place them about the hall. The banquet was at last due to commence, and the air had menace in it. The three visitors sat together on the right of the king who had donned the richly jeweled chain of kingship, while his son and several pale-faced female members of the royal line sat on the left, unspeaking even among themselves. Prince heard. A sullen-faced youth who seemed to bear a resentment against his father picked at the unappetizing food which was served them all. He drank heavily of the wine which had little flavor but was strong. Fiery stuff, this seemed to warm the company a little. And what do the gods want us? What do the gods want of us, poor folk of Orc? Heard said, staring hard at Zarazinia with more than friendly interest. Elric answered, They ask nothing of you but your recognition. In return, they will, on occasions, help you. That is all. Heard laughed. That is more than those from the hill can offer. Eh, father. Gatteran turned his great head slowly to regard his son. Yes. He murmured and the war seemed to carry warning. Moonglum said, The hill, what is that? He got no reply. Instead of a high-pitched laugh, instead a high-pitched laugh came from the entrance to the great hall. A thin, 
gaunt man stood there staring ahead, staring ahead with a fixed gaze. His features, though emaciated, strongly resembled gutterants. He carried a stringed instrument and plucked at the gut so that it wailed and moaned with melancholy insistence. Kurt said savagely, Look, father, this blind vicar, the minstrel, your brother, shall he sing for us? Sing? Shall he sing his songs, father? Guterin's mouth trembled and twisted, and he said after a moment, He may entertain our guests with an heroic blood if he wishes. But, But certain other songs she shall not sing, Kurt grins maliciously. He may entertain our guests with an heroic ballad if he wishes, but, but certain other songs she shall not sing. Kurt grind maliciously. He seemed to be tormenting his father deliberately in some way which Elric could not guess. Kurt shouted at the blind man. Come, Uncle Vika, sing. There are strangers present, said Verkert hollowly above the veil of his own music. Strangers in org. Erdigli and more wine. Guterin scowled and continued to tremble, gnawing at his nails. Elric called. Wait up, appreciate a song, minstrel. Then you'll have the Song of the Three Kings in Darkness, strangers. And he, the ghastly story of the kings of Orc. No, shouted Gadaran, leaping from his place, but Vircard was already singing. Three kings in darkness line, got around work in dying under a bleak and sunless sky. The third beneath the hill, when shall the third arise? Only when another dies. Stop. Gatoran got up in an obviously, in an obviously, in an obviously insane rage and stumbled across the table, trembling in terror, his face blanched, striking at the blind man, his brother. Two blows and the minstrel fell, slumping to the floor and not moving. Take him out. Do not let him enter again. The king shrieked and foam flecked his lips. Heard sober for a moment, jumped across the table, scattering dishes and cups, and took his father's arm. Be calm, father. I have a new plan for our entertainment. Yo, yo seek my throne. Twas you go with Vicar to sing his dreadful song. You know I cannot listen without 
He stared at the door. One day the legend shall be realized and the kill king shall come. Then shall I, you and Org, perish. Father. Heard was smiling horribly. Let the female visitor dance for us a dance of the gods. What? Let the woman dance for us, father. Elric heard him. By now the drug must have worn off. He could not afford to show his hand by offering his companions further doses. He got to his feet. What sacrilege do you speak, Prince? We have given you entertainment. It is the custom in Orc for our visitors to give us entertainment also. The hall was filled with menace. Elric regretted his plan to trick the man of Orc. But there was nothing he could do. He had intended to exact tribute from them in the name of the gods. But, obviously, these madmen feared more immediate and tangible dangers than any the gods might represent. He had made a mistake, put the lives of his friends in danger as well as his own. What should he do? Zarazinia murmured. I have learned dances in Ilmiora, where all ladies are thought the arts. Let me dance for them. It might place it them and bedazzle them to make our work easier. Eriok knows our work is hard enough now. I was a fool to have conceived this plan. Very well, Zarazinia. Dance for them, but with caution. He shouted at her. Our companion will dance for you, to show you the beauty that the gods create. Then you must pay the tribute, for our masters grow impatient. The tribute. Gatteran looked up. You mentioned nothing of tribute. Your recognition of the gods must take the form of precious stones and metals, King Gatteran. I thought you to understand that. You seem more like common thieves than uncommon messengers, my friends. We are poor in Orc and have nothing to give you away to charlatans. Beware of your words, King. Elric's clear voice echoed warningly through the hall. We'll see the dance and then judge the truth of what you told us. Elric seated himself, grasped Zarazinia's hand beneath the table as she arose, giving her comfort. She walked gracefully and confidently into the center of the hall and there began to dance. Elric, who loved her, was amazed at her splendid grace and artistry. She danced the old, beautiful dances of Ilmior, entrancing even the thick schooled man of Orc. And as she danced, a great golden guest cup was brought in. Kurd leaned across his father and said to Elric, The guest cup, lords, it is our custom 
that our guests drink from it in friendship. Elric nodded, annoyed at being disturbed in his watching of the wonderful dance. His eyes fixed on Zarazinia as she postured, as she postured and glided. There was silence in the hall. Kurt handed him the cup and absently he put it to his lips. Seeing this, Zarazinia danced onto the table and began to wave along it to where Elric sat and began to wave along it to where Elric sat. As he took the first seat, Zarazinia cried out and, with her foot, knocked the cup from his hands. The wine splashed onto Gadaran and heard who half rose, startled. It was drugged, Elric. They drugged it. Her lashed at her with his hands, striking her across the face. She fell from the table and lay moaning slightly on the filthy floor. Bitch! Would the messengers of gods be harmed by a little drugged wine? Enraged, Elric pushed aside Gataran and struck savagely at her, so that the young man's mouth gushed blood. But the drug was already having effects. Gadaran shouted something, and Moonglum drew his saber, glancing upwards. Elric was swaying, his senses were jumbled and the scene had an unreal quality. He saw servants grasp Zarazini, but could not see how Moonglum was faring. He felt sick and dizzy, could hardly control his limbs. Summoning up his last remaining strength, Elric dubbed her down with one tremendous blow. Then he collapsed into unconsciousness.